Hello and welcome to the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty's uh, webinar on how to make human and civil rights real. My name is Eric Tars. I'm the senior attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, and we're happy to have you here with us today. Uh, today we're lucky to have several other highly qualified speakers to share with you some of the information uh, we're about to present. We have Tenjiwe McCarris from the U.S. Human Rights Network, Tricia Bauman also with the Law Center, and Richie Epping of the ACLU of Idaho. Today we'll be talking about three reports that we've uh, recently put out. First, uh, our report on human rights and moving to human reality, um, moving from the general down to the specific level. Uh, we'll then be talking about our human right to housing report card. And finally, our manual on criminalization of homelessness and what can be done at the local level. Because of the large number of people on this webinar, we're muting people's microphones. But if people have questions throughout the presentation, just type them into the chat box on the GoToWebinar panel on the side of your screen. And we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. But before we go too far, uh, let's just do a quick poll and see what people's baseline is. Janelle, can you facilitate that? So the question is, have you used the human rights framework in your advocacy before? All right. Great. So, Janelle, uh, I guess if you can put the results up on your screen. All right. Thanks a lot, Chanel. Um, and so with that, we'll uh, continue on to uh, the first report. Um, so basically, we understand that some people have used a little, more have used, um, haven't yet uh, encountered uh, human rights as part of their advocacy. And uh, I just want to start off by talking about, about how we, over the past two decades, have really incorporated human rights as part of our advocacy strategy. Uh, this started off. Um, as a, a way for us to uh, really envision our rights um, as in a new form. Um, and we've moved from this aspirational uh, aspect down to a very real aspect. Uh, and at the close of 2014, we have gotten three international human rights treaty monitoring bodies who oversee the U.S. Uh, human rights treaty implementation to call for more action on a specific issue, criminalization of homelessness, uh, including specific recommendations to create federal funding incentives to discourage the practice. Now that, on its own, we would say it might be impressive, but the real breakthrough is that through our advocacy with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, those recommendations are actually being put into practice. This past year, the Interagency Council on Homelessness launched a new web page dedicated to human rights and alternatives to criminalization of homelessness. HUD issued policy guidance which emphasized the importance of a human rights approach to ending homelessness and pointed out that criminalization measures are not aligned with this approach. And now we are working with both of those agencies to implement the funding incentives. This report, which we put out, which was done in conjunction with the Human Rights at Home campaign, more on that later, lays out the steps we've taken to get from the broad aspirations to actually implementing human rights policy uh, at the federal level in government. And we hope that people can learn from both our successes and our mistakes. The first step in our work was to vision our work as human rights work, to do the research either on your own or with the help of a pro bono law firm or a human rights clinic at a law school, and think about how human rights standards apply to your issues. For us, we decided that we couldn't accomplish our mission of preventing and ending homelessness until housing was seen as a human right, 
and the policies were in place to support that. So we researched the standards using pro bono assistance. We analyzed how they apply to our issues, and now we're doing an annual human rights report card, which we'll talk about later, which is a great exercise to engage in to really help think about how the standards apply here in the U.S. We then spent the better part of a decade doing trainings nationally and locally to create an educated cadre of homeless advocates who were excited to talk about housing as a human right. We did many of these together with international and local partners to help our, augment our own expertise. And importantly, we invited federal and local officials to present at these trainings, both to share their own expertise, but also specifically with a view to having them hear from the others on the panels and in the audience about housing as a human right. This familiarized the officials we would later be seeking policy change from with the framework we were applying, and it showed them that it wasn't just us, but a whole movement of people who were asking for it. And we made sure that these trainings were geared to producing concrete outcomes or work plans of how to get there to keep the momentum going beyond the trainings themselves. The best way to promote human rights accountability is, unsurprisingly, to use human rights standards to hold government accountable. The targets of our advocacy are not likely to introduce human rights standards into the debate on their own, so it's up to us as advocates if we want to see them becoming the relevant measuring stick. We have been consistently including human rights analysis in all of our reports, and two years ago, the Interagency Council on Homelessness put out a report of their own talking about criminalization of homelessness, not just as a constitutional issue, but as a treaty rights violation the first time any domestically focused agency has talked about a domestic practice as a human rights violation. How do we know that this was because of our reports? Well, the citation for this links directly to our reports. So had we not included this language in our report in the first place, the Interagency Council would never have been able to include it in their report. And once we got this key language, we've been building upon it, lifting ourselves up by our bootstraps ever since. While using existing human rights standards in your materials is important, it's equally important to participate in the development of new standards by using human rights mechanisms at the international level. We decided for a number of reasons not simply to bring every issue we were working on to the international level, but to focus on a specific issue, criminalization of homelessness, where we believed we could make a difference and create a model that could then be expanded on. So we worked across multiple treaties and with different special rapporteurs to create a new international norm around criminalization, and we've been successful in that. As we've been doing this international work, we've also been using the standards we've been creating domestically. We've been hosting international human rights monitors on official visits, as well as hosting unofficial meetings between these monitors and federal officials. We've participated in the major treaty review processes and pushed beyond them. In short, we've been creative in finding and creating opportunities to bring the international into our domestic advocacy. And that's how we've continued to deepen our base across the country and within the government. The key is not simply to sit back and accept what might come to you, but to think about how the process could work, be worked to its greatest advantage. For example, the UN Special Rapporteurs on Human Rights make annual reports to the General Assembly but we can inform those reports and get the standards that we want into those reports and then get that rapporteur to come from New York down to D.C. or wherever you are while they're in the country presenting at the General Assembly uh, to have a meeting and to use that opportunity simply to prompt the meeting to familiarize officials with that uh, aspect of the right that you want to talk about and then to press for, for change. It's not going to change things overnight but it's part of building a record on the issue and building a record with these officials about the relevance of these standards. We've also sought out complementary opportunities to elevate our language. For example, we've gotten a resolution on the human right to housing from the American Bar Association. While this isn't legally binding, it's important to show to lawyers and judges that the concepts we are arguing for are part of the legal mainstream. We've also worked to help local groups pass resolutions or planning documents addressing housing as a human right. For example, three years ago, Madison, Wisconsin passed such a resolution, and this past year, they dedicated $8 million of new increased funding towards affordable housing construction. 
citing their commitment to implementing this right. The next step is the most basic, but I think in some ways the most essential part of what we've done differently than others in building our successful campaign. We did not let ourselves be limited to the big consultations or working group meetings put on by the government where we could testify for a couple minutes and get a simple, similarly limited response. We got the cards of people at those meetings and we followed up. As I noted before, we created more opportunities by tagging our advocacy to external human rights events like rapporteurs visits or treaty reviews, and each one was incremental on its own, but the persistence and the repetition of these conversations is what's moved the baseline for us from initial familiarity to active adoption. As an example, <clears throat> just today, we used the opportunity of the uh, uh, International uh, Human Rights Day to put out a blog together with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. And this, this experience has both deepened the printed uh, commitment that they have on their website to talking about housing as a human rights issue and homelessness as a human rights issue, but also the simple interaction with the staff there continues to deepen our relationship with them in a positive way, uh, not always the uh, hectoring way that uh, advocates are sometimes accused of. <clears throat> the next step in the process is to document your success to make more success. And many of you have been probably subject to our emails, to all of our listservs that we're part of, trumpeting each success we've had in getting more recognition of our issue as a human rights issue by the government or by other officials. My apologies if that's been overwhelming, but it's part of our strategy for success. We're sending those emails out not just to our non-governmental allies, but to those in the government and at the international level. So for example, when we got the reference to human rights in the Searching Out Solutions report I showed before, we then shared it with the UN rapporteurs who had commented on criminalization of homelessness previously. And we got them to give the US credit in a press release, uh, which we then sent back to our government contacts, giving them more positive reinforcement, while further establishing the credibility of the norm we had created and the relevance of those rapporteurs. We also haven't let the lack of mainstream media coverage limit us from getting our own word about, out about treaty reviews and other international happenings by producing our own media reports from Geneva, for example, that we could send to our allies to keep them informed and engaged. The next step in the process is to make the rights real. And as noted above, the human rights standards are often very general, and it takes significant work to get from a broad right to adequate housing or freedom from cruel and human and degrading treatment to something like HUD needs to include a question about criminalization of homelessness on its next funding application. But by mapping the steps we needed to get from the current growth of criminalization to stopping it, we decided that focusing on the HUD grant process was critical. So we used the treaty processes, not just the review, but the whole process, to prompt meetings with government officials, show them what we would be holding them accountable to, and push them for action. And through all the education and engagement, we've built allies within the government who are now comfortable talking about human rights obligations. And as I said before, there's now a whole page of the Interagency Council on Homelessness website dedicated to human rights. We are making these rights real, small step by small step at a time. So even if HUD puts out its question on criminalization next year, as we hope, we will continue to monitor and make sure that the question is creating the impact on the enjoyment of human rights of homeless peoples that we want. If so, we will give credit and promote the success, and if not, we will hold the government accountable, both through the international processes that I've mentioned before and through our own domestic advocacy, such as our Human Right to Housing Report Card that I'll talk about more in a minute. We're also going to continue working as part of the Human Rights at Home campaign to build the infrastructure within the government to translate human rights recommendations into human rights reality. And here to talk about that is Tenjiwe McHarris from the US Human Rights Network, who leads the uh, coordination of the Human Rights at Home campaign. Tenjiwe, do you want to uh, take over? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eric. And thanks to the National Law Center um, for having us on this webinar. We're, well, first, I'm really excited 
to speak about who the U.S. Human Rights Network is, what the Human Rights at Home campaign is, um, as well as the need for a human rights movement in the U.S., how we build it, um, and what people can do now to join not just the movement, but specifically the, the Human Rights at Home campaign. So first, let me start briefly by saying the U.S. Human Rights Network is a national network of organizations and individuals working to strengthen a human rights movement and culture within the United States, led by people most directly impacted by human rights violations. We work to secure dignity and justice for all. The network works to build a broad base of and vibrant domestic human rights movement. We utilize approaches um, in our effort to promote rights-based discourse in the U.S. and to bring about real and sustainable positive change. Our work focuses on the following areas. One, engaging, connecting, and mobilizing communities, people, workers, and a diverse sector across issue areas and regions to uphold and defend human rights and hold government accountable. Two, building the capacity and leadership of grassroots groups and individuals to effectively apply the human rights framework in developing strategy and making long-term structural shifts to achieve justice. Three, raising the visibility of local human rights concerns and activism to shape the public discourse locally, nationally, and internationally. And last, four, facilitating effective collective action to secure the structural change needed to fully realize human rights. So I work um, as the Human Rights at Home Campaign Director. And the Human Rights at Home Campaign is a collaborative effort to help ensure that human rights principles standards and obligations are considered and implemented in all areas of domestic policy and practice by promoting the adoption of concrete accountability mechanisms in the United States. I'm going to share briefly Hoorah's goals. Uh, Human Rights at Home campaign also goes by the name of Hoorah, um, which is H-U-R-H uh, is our acronym. Um, the first goal, uh, like Eric shared before, is holding the United States accountable for its human rights obligations through, through trying to promote and institutionalize what we call the Equality Working Group, which essentially acts as a federal focal point for coordination and implementation of U.S. human rights obligations, including but not limited to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the Convention Against Torture, um, as well as the universal periodic review, um, uh, as well as promoting other domestic human rights organizing. Our second goal is promoting the development and use of other accountability structures at the federal, state, and local levels for human rights compliance, including the continued support of work to reform and strengthen the capacity of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission and create a national human rights institution. Our next goal is expanding grassroots outreach, capacity, and engagement in informing and advancing human rights accountability mechanisms, including uh, the Equality Working Group, uh, the group that I mentioned earlier in our first goal. Uh, the next goal is advancing specific issue area campaigns focused on eliminating discrimination against, uh, uh, against and criminaliz criminalization of vulnerable groups by actively working with and promoting the strengthening, again, of the Equality Working Group. Our next goal, and the last that I'll share today for the goal for the Human Rights at Home campaign, um, is to help build, strengthen, and grow the human rights movement in the United States by engage, engaging with directly impacted communities and grassroots uh, organizations across the country. So now I want to talk a bit about um, why the U.S. Human Rights Network focuses on building the human rights movement um, in the United States. And then I'm going to talk a bit about how we continue to build that movement, and then again, what, what people can do right now to join Hoorah in our efforts to hold the U.S. accountable for its human rights obligations. So the first is the need uh, for a human rights movement. We've all seen through our history and currently with um, the movement happening now, the power of people, particularly people when they come together um, across, uh, ge across uh, geographical boundaries, across issues, um, to, under a unified voice, call for the protection and the respect of human rights um, in the United States, as well as around the world. And so as we continue as advocates 
to um, advocate for the United States, again, to protect uh, and defend human rights, um, as well as to come into compliance with the treaties that we've ratified, we know how important it is to have a movement, uh, a grassroots movement, people who are directly affected by human rights violations that occur within the United States to play a role in making sure the U.S. is responsible and accountable for human rights violations, but also to make sure the, U the U.S. Um, does what it needs to do to, again, pr to protect and defend human rights in the United States. And so that's the need um, for human rights movement. And again, I just want to reiterate, um, when people come together, again, across, uh, across their own movement, across their, their issue area, as well as across the nation, under one voice to call for human rights in the United States, um, we, uh, we as, a, we as a, a movement and as advocates have that much more power in holding the United States government responsible for its human rights obligations. And so the next is how we build it. And I think I spoke a bit about it and why it's important. We build it by connecting and working directly with people most impacted, um, connecting and working with people who are organizing on a various number of issues in the United States, and talking about the, 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 the need, but also how using a human rights frame is useful and using the international accountability mechanisms that Eric spoke to before and I spoke to a bit earlier, uh, particularly the treaties that we've ratified um, as a way in which to advance um, the, the, the work uh, that individuals or organizations are doing on a particular issue. So again, it's talking about human rights, it's building the capacity around what human rights is, what these accountability mechanisms are, um, as well as how using a human rights frame could be useful for advocacy, not just at the national level, but at the local level as well as at the state level. Um, and again, it's connecting people across issue areas. Um, uh, and an example of that is um, that for this last review uh, that was held in November for the Convention Against Torture, uh, the U.S. Human Rights Network um, helped coordinate a delegation of, of people from the United States, about um, between 70 to 80 individuals representing various organizations around the country went to Geneva to advocate on their issue, um, uh, everything, you know, issues streaming from um, trans violence to police violence to um, uh, issues surrounding um, uh, national security. And we brought together, in particular, the parents of Michael Brown, Leslie McSpadden, and Michael Brown Sr. to speak to the issue of police violence in the U.S. And at many times, particularly when talking about human rights accountability, we, we, we connected the parents of Mike Brown and those advocating around police violence with a former Guantanamo detainee and organizations that were advocating around the human rights violations that the United States um, commits abroad as well. And so connecting the, the connecting torture being committed um, by torture, cruel, and inhumane degrading uh, treatment and punishment connect, uh, that, that is happening around the world um, uh, at the hands of the U.S., but also torture and cruel and inhumane degrading treatment also happening in the United States. So again, we saw the power of connecting um, people and movements and organizations um, across issue area um, and some of also across movement to advocate again for a human rights movement that holds the U.S. responsible for its human rights obligations um, both in the United States and outside of the United States. And so I'm going to finish with what you can do now. So that, again, the Human Rights at Home campaign is, um, is a campaign where people can and organizations can directly work uh, with a, a number of organizations in holding the U.S. accountable through direct advocacy with the U.S. government and as well as building this large grassroots human rights movement in this country. And so I welcome everyone to join the Human Rights at Home campaign listserv as well as connect with me directly to hear more about the Human Rights at Home campaign as well as how you might be able to get involved. So Eric, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Tenjiwe, um, and uh, thanks for your partnership on the Human Rights at Home campaign. 
Um, uh, <clears throat> I'll now move on to uh, the next section, uh, um, the next report that we've just put out um, on uh, the human right to housing in the U.S. So this is one way that we are uh, holding our government accountable. We've been doing this uh, report card um, every year since 2011. 2011 was actually a significantly larger report, over 100 pages long. This is just a 20-page uh, update um, of that report, uh, but we feel it's important to continuously hold the government accountable um, uh, to, to these standards, uh, even if in a more abbreviated format. Um, so. Uh, as you can see, we break down the grades of our government uh, by the internationally approved criteria about uh, the right to housing. The right to housing is more than just four walls and a roof. It's the security of tenure in your dwelling. Can you be evicted for complaining about the conditions? Is your mortgage written in a way to almost guarantee you'll end up losing the house? Is it affordable? Is it inaccessible to, due to race, disability, gender, former incarceration, or other reasons? All these different components um, go into the human right to housing, and we measure them all against our country's available resources. Yes, overall in the U.S. we enjoy a better standard of living than in many other countries, but in the richest country on the globe, we should be doing much, much better in guaranteeing a minimum adequate standard for all of our residents. I'm not going to go into all of these uh, different categories today because of time, but I'm happy to discuss some of them some more in the time for questions at the end of today's presentation or offline with people after the presentation. Um, however, as you can see, the grades haven't improved much over the past few years, um, although there are some notable exceptions here and there. But just as one example of how we are using this report, uh, this year we gave the U.S. a slightly improved grade on criminalization of homelessness thanks to the engagement of the U.S. Interagency Council and HUD with human rights, but it's still only a D-plus because despite the positive rhetoric coming from the agencies, we have also documented a huge growth in the criminalization of homelessness across the country. And until we see a reversal in that trend in the enjoyment of human rights of people on the ground, we must continue to hold the government accountable at the federal, state, and local levels, um, as I said, in conjunction with the earlier report. Um, so this is just uh, one example of how we are using this report card as part of our advocacy. There's much more uh, discussion in depth, um, but with that I do want to transition into our final section on our final report. Beyond what we're doing at the federal level, what can we do about criminalization at the local level? Uh, but first I want to do a, one quick check-in, um, and Janelle, if you can give us another poll uh, about uh, whether or not people have a better understanding of how to apply human rights to their work as a result of uh, the webinar so far. So thanks to all of you who are voting. It looks like we've got a, a pretty good uh, percentage of people who have improved their understanding, and um, certainly we are happy to work with people to do more on that front. Uh, but with that, uh, now I'll move on to our final report, which are, is our No Safe Place Advocacy Manual. Um, Christia, would you like to talk a little bit more about how people can use, uh, use some of these international standards as well as uh, court standards and other policy advocacy um, to help with, uh, at the very local level, uh, advocacy against criminalization policies. Yes, thank you, Eric. Uh, as Eric mentioned, my name is Tristia Bellman. I'm a senior attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. I'm going to be speaking with you today a bit about the uh, Law Center Report and Advocacy Manual, which is a companion piece to our No Safe Place Report on the Criminalization of Homelessness. 
And when I talk about the criminalization of homelessness, as many of you know, I'm referring to laws that are passed often at the local level, at the city level, that criminalize the life-sustaining activities of homeless people, like sleeping or sitting down, when performed in public places. Uh, the No Safe Place report that was released in July uh, is available on our website, and that report showed a marked increase in criminalization laws across the country. For example, since 2011, when our last report was issued, there has been a 60% increase in laws criminalizing camping in public. And anti-camping laws are often broadly defined to include merely sleeping in public or perhaps uh, being awake with one's belongings in a public place. Uh, no Safe Place also describes how criminalization laws, uh, laws are ineffective at solving the underlying causes of homelessness, and in fact, they often make the problem worse through the collateral consequences of the criminal convictions. They are expensive to taxpayers by only cycling people temporarily through a very costly criminal justice system, and these laws often violate the civil and human rights of homeless people. So that's why we have a companion piece in the Advocacy Manual, and what that manual is essentially is an additional resource for legal and policy advocates working on the ground to combat criminalization in their communities. In the manual, there uh, is inclusion of summaries of cases challenging criminalization laws since the release of our last manual in 2011. There's also a trends analysis of the case law uh, that can be helpful in uh, providing a national perspective on how courts across the country are treating uh, the criminalization laws. There's also guidance to legal advocates on bringing lit litigation uh, and guidance to policy advocates um, under what we call public awareness strategies. And I'll be discussing both litigation and public awareness strategies in a bit more detail in the next couple of slides. Also included in the report are some model police policies for contact with homeless people and also for cleaning public places. So as I said, since 2011, uh, we did an analysis of cases challenging criminalization laws. And what we found is that in the majority of cases challenging criminalization laws, uh, positive outcomes for homeless people and their advocates have been achieved. And when I refer to these positive outcomes, um, I'm referring to favorable results in the uh, way of success in securing injunctions to prevent enforcement of the challenge laws, awards of monetary damages, settlements that modified laws or altered patterns of enforcement to comport with the civil rights of, uh, and human rights of homeless people. Uh, some examples are, uh, you know, breaking that down more specifically and giving you some examples. In 100% of cases challenging food sharing laws uh, since 2011, there have been positive outcomes for homeless people. An example is the case of Big Heart Ministries versus the City of Dallas, in which the Law Center served as co-counsel. Uh, in that case, faith-based organizations challenged a law restricting food sharing in the City of Dallas. And a federal court there found that the ordinance placed a substantial burden on the plaintiff's sincerely held religious beliefs in violation of the Texas Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, in that case, the court didn't reach the constitutional claims, uh, but they were raised. And it should be noted that a similar law was struck down under Pennsylvania, uh, out of Philadelphia under Pennsylvania's um, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And there is currently a challenge pending against a Fort Lauderdale ordinance that's been highly publicized um, <clears throat> under Florida's Religious Freedom Law. Also, 71% of challenges to anti-camping laws have been successful. An example is in the case of Anderson v. the City of Portland. There, a federal court found that homeless plaintiffs adequately stated a claim that enforcement of Portland's anti-camping law when there was insufficient shelter and housing to meet the need criminalized homeless people for engaging in involuntary and innocent conduct in violation of the Eighth Amendment protection from cruel and unusual punishment. And that case ultimately resolved in a settlement agreement that required the city to make $37,000 available for area rental assistance and also required the police department to change some of its policies. Also, 66% of anti-solicitation laws have been successfully challenged. One example is the case of Beat v. Schwett 
in, uh, in which a federal court struck down a Michigan anti-begging statute as an unconstitutional infringement of First Amendment rights. Now, sometimes these, case, uh, these laws are upheld by the courts as uh, reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. But in the overwhelming majority, as you can see, uh, the litigation has been successful on some level. Um, it's, of course, important to build a strong case, build a strong factual record, and the manual does provide, as I said, some guidance to legal advocates on how to style a cause and how to build that factual record. Um, but ultimately, the key conclusion to draw from all of this is just what we said in the No Safe Place report. Criminalization is a losing strategy for cities. These laws are not only ineffective and wasteful of limited community resources, but they might result in litigation that the cities are likely to lose. Moving on to the policy advocacy strategies that are uh, entitled public awareness strategies. Uh, there are several different um, tools provided in the manual that may be helpful to policy advocates on the ground. Uh, first, we provide some guidance on how to calculate the cost of criminalization to assist in policy advocacy. And clearly, establishing for a local government who's determining how to address homelessness in its community, convincing them uh, using data that criminalization is the much, much uh, more costly alternative um, that's not effective and potentially illegal is going to be um, helpful in persuading them to uh, choose other alternative strategies, like, for example, uh, creating housing. Uh, and so with respect to calculating the cost of criminalization, we give some uh, tips on how to track homeless individuals' use of various services in order to compute costs. Uh, for example, uh, number of jail days, emergency room visits, number of services utilized in veterans' emergency systems. Uh, there's also some information about how uh, you can calculate the uh, and look at the number of people who were in jail during the point in time count and what you might do with that data to establish the cost of criminalization in a local community. There's also some guidance on how to use public records and to make public records requests. Uh, we provide information on, um, indeed, how to make those requests under freedom of information laws. Uh, and then there's also guidance on which records to request to get at the information uh, that you're hoping for to further your policy uh, advocacy goals. For example, you may wish to request records related to jail capacity and the cost of incarceration and prosecution. Or, uh, or perhaps in addition to that, you would want to request records related to suites of homeless encampments or official policies related to cleaning public spaces, in addition to email communications between city officials about homelessness and um, other tips of that nature. In addition, we uh, discuss the use of surveys and how surveys can be a valuable tool when trying to gather information about the impact of criminalization measures in a given city. Surveying people who are homeless can help identify which laws are being enforced against homeless people and help to identify any problems with that enforcement. So in the manual, we have tips on how to develop a survey, how to recruit surveyors, where to conduct the surveys, and issues related to confidentiality and compiling data. We also provide a model survey um, in the manual itself for uh, your reference. And additionally, we uh, also provide some tips on how to work with and use the power of the media to uh, best communicate the messaging around your advocacy and to really get ahead of the storytelling uh, to capture the hearts and minds of those in your community so that the positive policies are the ones that are ultimately favored rather than criminalization policies. And although it's not included in the slides, and I'm not going to go into it in detail in this uh, portion of this particular webinar, as I said earlier, the advocacy manual also does include some model policies that can serve as a tool for local governments who are looking at, uh, at um, enhancing their strategies for contact with homeless people and also cleaning uh, public spaces. Thank you very much.
Excellent. So uh, now to uh, thank you, uh, Justia, and um, now I'd like to turn it over to Richie Epping from the ACLU of Idaho, who we partnered with uh, in working against a specific case uh, this past year, uh, successfully stopping the enforcement of a panhandling ordinance. Um, but Richie's going to talk a little bit about how uh, this work often goes on on the ground and how some of the, uh, the tools in the toolkit that we provide might be applicable. So, Richie. Thanks, Eric, and thanks um, very much to the center for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm here to share what um, this looks like, and by this I, I mean sort of the, the tools that are included in that uh, advocacy manual. We've used a lot of them in uh, our work here in Idaho, and specifically in Boise. The history of work in Boise is um, beginning to become a bit of a saga when the current administration came into um, its offices uh, about almost 10 years ago now. Um, they uh, sort of marshaled a shelter, an emergency shelter that was being run by uh, a nonprofit organization over to a religious organization that would not house men and women together and they got sued for that and we were able to obtain a, a million dollar jury verdict against the city for that discrimination during that period while that case was going on the city began to um, uh, aggressively enforce its existing camping ordinance and its disturbing the peace ordinance which sleeping in Boise is considered by the government to be disturbing the peace and so the city got sued for that. That case is an NLCHP case along with um, Idaho Legal Aid Services and uh, a private law firm that is is still going on um, and hopefully will be successful soon. The city um, also, while both of those cases were going on, then also decided to pass a law that was go that banned panhandling and all, and all solicitation in a number of zones, primarily in the downtown area, and they got sued for that. I'll come back and we'll sort of unpack how that case was done, uh, because it was done um, uh, with NLCHP's help and done very effectively, very quickly, and I think it's a great example of, of how this can work, um, uh, the tools that are in this advocacy manual. What I want to stress, though, is that even though I've just mentioned three lawsuits, is that you know, this work has, has not been uh, all about lawsuits. In fact, I think the bigger story is the, the community uh, of advocates, the community of activists, the community of the houseless people that um, are affected by these uh, unjust laws and how they've been able to work together and, and increasingly work together in, in some emergent capacity in Boise that goes far beyond the ACLU, far beyond uh, and LCHP, and in fact, I think that 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 we're sort of off, uh, off, off to the sides a little bit, although although definitely closely involved. And so, the two main pieces of the advocacy manual that the centers put out today, uh, or I guess recently, um, that in, are both litigation and public awareness. What we've done in Boise has been to really combine those in what's. I think a pretty holistic way and a pretty integrated way. And so it hasn't just been these lawsuits, it's been a whole bunch of things that those lawsuits operate in, in a broader context of, including doing um, know your rights trainings to make sure that uh, people who are going to be impacted by these laws know, know their rights when they're interacting with, with police officers, including public records requests. That's a, a, a tool that's mentioned in the manual. Um, there's been public records requests that have been done by the ACLU, public records requests that have been done by other pieces of the advocacy community, including the Homeless Coalition here. There's been training for advocates and others about how to use um, the federal the strings that are attached to federal dollars, the consolidated planning process that HUD mandates for uh, cities like Boise that are entitlement cities and receive CDBG funds and otherwise. There's been a lot of use of the press. We've tried to use the press both on the editorial pages and getting uh, coverage in um, the dailies and the weeklies of what's going on and developing uh, strong relationships with the press. And so when a lawsuit does come in, um, or be, begin to apparently be necessary because the city um, 
as you can tell from from what I've already told you about Boise, um, at least under this mayor, has has continued to be stubborn on this particular um, particular issue, um, and so sometimes it seems like a lawsuit is the only thing to change to change the outcome. Um, when a lawsuit does come in, it it operates in this it, it it swims in this sea of a whole bunch of other advocacy work that's that's been um, going on for quite a while and continues to, to grow as part of this emergent capacity in the community. So um, the panhandling case was the most recent case and it was filed in November and um, we got a decision on January 2nd of the following year, which was this year actually, it was um, about a year ago that this case started. We got a preliminary injunction within uh, two months and very shortly after that, within a couple of weeks after we got that preliminary injunction, the city repealed the ordinance and paid attorney's fees both to the ACLU and to the, to the, to the law center. And so how do we do that, the lawsuit it, itself? Well, first of all, all of that integrated advocacy and holistic advocacy that I was talking about just a second ago uh, was uh, in full swing during the summer when the city was considering this, and originally the city was considering not just a solicitation ordinance, but also a sit-lie ordinance and an ordinance that would prevent you from um, putting your stuff on the ground in the downtown area and in other public places. And so um, at that point, it was not a, uh, we were hoping that there would be no lawsuit uh, that was going to be needed. So in addition to testifying um, at um, uh, city council hearings. There was civil disobedience to disrupt some of those city council meetings. There were um, um, non-disobedient but still rallies and protests um, outside of city hall and around the city during that time. And eventually, as the city seemed to uh, be continuing to march towards passing at least the panhandling piece, um, the ACLU sent a letter, to, an open letter to the, the council warning them that what they were doing was not only as uh, many of the law center's reports uh, explain in great detail, not only ineffective and um, uh, costly, far more costly than humane ways of going about um, what the city was trying to do, uh, but also was unconstitutional. Uh, the city, unfortunately, did not heed that warning and went on to pass the panhandling piece of that uh, three-piece uh, uh, ordinance that they had originally considered. And that's when we began the litigation work, because at that point there was no changing the, the council's minds, although we did manage to change one council member's mind who voted no. Um, and that is a much bigger success than it probably sounds like in the, in the climate that uh, exists in this council and this city. How did we do the, the litigation itself? Well, the, the advocacy manual talks about a lot of the things that were so crucial in this um, this litigation and how successful it was and how quickly it was successful. We did um, uh, not necessarily formal surveying, but we, 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 we began meeting with um, people who were using the, the one uh, daytime shelter that, that Boise has, or the main daytime shelter that Boise has, and talking to people who were, who were coming to the daytime shelter and asking about what they did and, and um, uh, whether or not it's going to be violating this panhandling law. And we found, of course, that, that there were many people that were soliciting money were doing, doing so in ways that were uh, not violating any other laws and were not causing any other uh, problems that, that, would, that would deserve criminalization in any, in any way. Um, so that was uh, sort of an informal surveying, and that was a, allowed us not only to gather information about the law, how, what kind of impact the law would it have, but also to identify plaintiffs who had standing under the, 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 the standards that federal courts apply to determine whether or not you are significant, sufficiently impacted by a law to be able to bring a lawsuit about it. Um, we did get challenged by the city as to whether or not our plaintiffs had standing, and we, we survived that challenge, and so that work turned out to be important. We also gathered information in other ways, and in particular, this law banned panhandling in certain zones, which were described as, as um, you know, so many feet from an ATM or so many feet from uh, a business and things like that. And though we actually went on the ground, very much uh, literally on the ground with um, different um, 
low-cost surveying equipment to measure out all of these zones and then used uh, an expert who fortunately gave uh, his work to us for free to map all of those zones so we could show the court that really what the city was doing, even though they were trying to, to hide it essentially by, by using these descriptors in the ordinance, was to make it so that the whole downtown core in effect would be would be free of 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 the people that they for whatever reason don't want to be visible in that in that location. So we were able to make that map and then we were also able through all of these discussions to to come up with all of the many examples of of how absurd this law would be and the kind of completely innocuous things that it would that it would prohibit. And so we were able to gather all of that information, present it to the court, and within a very short time, before the law even took effect, um, we were able to get the, the court not only to say that it violated the, the First Amendment, but that it would be held to the highest uh, scrutiny that a federal court would apply such a law and, um, and enjoined the city from, from enforcing it. And like I said, that resulted in the city very quickly repealing it, having it to eat its words that gave us an, another great opportunity for a whole bunch of press and a, another opportunity to explain all of the things that the Law Center has found in its work and the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness has found in its reports um, and educate the public. Uh, and we've seen the, the public opinion starting to turn. We're still, we're, we're going into round four with the city still on this camping ordinance. Um, and I don't know that things are going to change without a, a change in the mayor's office, but I think the public's starting to really understand uh, these issues in a way that they had before, and we're able to shift to being more proactive um, in Boise. So hopefully we'll eventually be, um, we'll eventually get all of this work done, but the work still goes on in Boise. If anybody, um, I, I, it occurs to me that I probably should have included something on this little slide that you're looking at with my email address at least, but you can probably find me by just looking me up on the on the web at the ACLU of Idaho. So if, if, if I welcome anyone to contact me and we can talk about your city or your location and, and any lessons that, that Boise may have for you. So thanks again to the center and thank you, Eric, for letting me talk about this. My pleasure. And uh, yeah, um, on the final slide, we'll, we have everybody's contact information. So uh, they can, they will be able to track you down whether you like it or not. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully we will have a couple of qu uh, minutes for questions here, um, so please do stay on. Um, but uh, now we'll move to one final poll um, and just asking uh, of all the uh, information we've shared here today, are you likely to use that information in your work going forward, whether it's on the human rights front or on criminalization or uh, both? And seeing some very good numbers here. Uh, keep on voting for another minute or two. So yeah, that looks like uh, good enough for now. Looks like um, we've got. Uh, 95% of people saying they this will help them going forward, and we are very excited about that, obviously. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to questions now. Um, hopefully you are seeing our contact information on the screen. We are all happy to be in touch with people after uh, the, the presentation if people have specific questions. Um, one question I've seen uh, repeated several times is, will there be a link to the materials sent out? Um, will the presentation be available? And yes, we'll, we'll post the presentation to our website. Uh, the entire recorded version of the um, presentation, uh, if all goes well with uh, the technology, should be available on our YouTube site, which is youtube.com slash NLCHP. Um, should be posted there as a, a full audio and visual version, um, but we'll make the slides available as well. And all the reports, um, if you've signed up for the webinar, um, we have your email address and we will uh, be sending out an update email after the webinar with all of these materials together. Um, a couple of people have asked about um, specific efforts to empty uh, camps uh, in 
San Jose, in uh, Tampa, Florida, and other places, um, we'll, uh, we can respond to those questions individually. Um, in Honolulu, uh, we've got a new uh, law where that was just passed there, um, which we actually did submit testimony on. Um, so uh, if people want to contact us individually about uh, their local concerns, we'll, we'll be happy to um, try and follow up as much as we can. Um, so uh, the um, one person asked about on the continuum of care funding application process, um, are we asking HUD to put a question on the application form or make it a factor in scoring? Um, in, it's the latter. It's, uh, you know, this would actually um, grant points to communities that are taking positive steps to approach criminalization and withhold them if, it's, uh, if they are pursue, pursuing criminalization strategies. So that's, that's why we think it will be effective in ways that uh, other, um, you know, that it, the existing grant form hasn't been encouraging that although it is existing federal policy. So, you know, the, the federal government already understands, already promotes that um, the criminalization is poor public policy. It's uh, against our human rights obligations. It's against our constitutional obligations. But they haven't put those funding teeth into it yet, and that's um, what we are hoping to see in the, the next funding application coming out next year. Um, uh, Got a question about um, uh, moving uh, state bills of uh, homeless bills of rights and speaking to the legal arguments about why this is a state issue. It could be litigated at the state level um, to end criminalization. Um, I don't know if uh, if Richie or um, or Tristia wants to comment about that. Um, but you know, we do know that uh, homeless bills of rights are stuff that many communities are taking right now uh, to help to uh, you know not just oppose the laws uh, that are coming out, but to take a positive step to try and stop them and, and change the, the direction of the debate around homelessness. Uh, we put out guidance earlier this year on homeless bills of rights uh, that you can find on our website. Um, but in terms of uh, legal arguments that could be used to explain why this is a state issue um, and can be litigated at the state level to end criminalization. Um, I guess my comments would be much of our litigation is uh, federal, based on the federal constitution, but all of that is also, you know, state level, state, states have constitutions and statutes that could be applied. Um, the panhandling ordinances, um, you know, may fall foul of uh, different state uh, constitutions. The, the the Michigan state case on panhandling was, for example, a state level case. Uh, the food sharing cases um, have often been decided on state law grounds. Um, so those are both uh, reasons uh, that it, it has been addressed uh, through state level litigation. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other comments on that at this point. Yeah, I would, I would just add, this is Tricia from the Law Center, I would just add that uh, oftentimes these state laws preclude anyone in the state, including um, actors at the municipal level, from violating certain rights of homeless people, like, for example, invading um, the privacy and expectation of their property, or also restricting them from moving freely about public spaces based on their status as homeless people. Um, so bringing state court litigation can be proper not only for jurisdictional reasons, but also because um, some of these criminalization laws uh, prevent precisely those things and hit the heart of the uh, protections that the Homeless Bill of Rights is uh, meant to protect against. Thanks, Justia. Um, so looking uh, uh, there's a one um, one question about pursuing litigation under the ADA um, given the, the the disparate impact of homelessness on uh, and particularly chronic homelessness on dis uh, disabled persons um, 
that's definitely another angle that it, it is a potential, um, and that's uh, something that's discussed in both uh, our, our reports, I believe. Um, uh, somebody's asking a question about tiny house village efforts, um, uh, you know, creating uh, micro housing communities uh, for homeless people, uh, especially for uh, emergency or cold weather shelter, but for, for all year as well. Um, I think that's it's a it's one strategy to to propose. I think we're slightly hesitant to push it too much um, because. Uh, because we believe that the, the bigger problem is the lack of o overall affordable housing that's causing people to become homeless in the first place. So it, the, the solution is not simply to create um, more shelters or more uh, alternative housing communities, but simply to strengthen the overall affordable housing market. In, in the meantime, you know, the, these uh, micro-housing communities are a solution that are, um, are filling the gap, but uh, you know, it, it's kind of that um, uh, band-aid versus stanching the flow of, of the, the bleeding at some higher up point uh, kind of approach. So um, I think uh, if people are advocating for, for those housing communities, um, human rights is definitely a, could be a part of the, the arguments to support them. Um, and, uh, you know, because it is addressing the very real, very immediate need for uh, basic shelter in a community. Um, but I think uh, it, it would, ha in, in terms of uh, winning the, not just the short-term battle, but the long-term war on poverty and war on homelessness, um, you know, to use that framing, we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we do keep that larger goal in mind. Um, and so, uh, some micro housing communities might be fully adequate housing, but you know a, a tent city, uh, even though we would support its existence um, as long as there isn't an adequate alternative, we would also say that that is in fact uh, the tent city itself is not all adequate housing, um, and therefore uh, communities are still on the hook uh, to do to more uh, to house those people. Um, and I would only add to that, Eric, that in the No Safe Place report uh, issued in July, there is a small section on microhousing. So for more information, uh, readers can, can turn to that document. Thanks. Um, there's a question about, any, is anyone challenging homeless courts from a human rights framework as they continue to criminalize homelessness and pump resources into the criminal justice system? Um, uh, again, I, I think... Uh, uh, it's a, it's one of those questions of uh, you know are they doing positive things at a local level um, in terms of making sure people don't have uh, additional criminal records created yes in, in homeless courts I should note are courts that are uh, created to deal with the huge number of citations that homeless people uh, may be uh, getting and help them uh, get connected to services rather than to prison, um, but the, you know, as the, the questioner correctly notes, that the bigger question is, you know, why are there uh, those criminalizing ordinances in the first place? Uh, we would advocate um, that the ordinances themselves are the problem, not the fact that homeless people are getting huge numbers of citations under them that need to be processed through separate courts because they're clogging up the regular court system. So, um, so yeah, I, I would say. Uh, there could be effective arguments made against uh, uh, against the ordinances themselves. Um, you know, we, we appreciate that uh, people are trying to do some uh, you know more limited, immediate good by creating those courts. But uh, the larger problem is the criminalization of homelessness overall. Um. Uh, all right, I think those are, are most of the questions that we can answer uh, here immediately. Um, 
How about uh, there's um, uh, there's a question. What would your answer be when city councils state issues with sanitation when they defend their anti-camping laws? Um, I don't know if Tristia or uh, Richie, you would want to try and address that, um, but I think that is uh, it's a good question, um, and it's a, a frequent uh, excuse that communities use um, sometimes for uh, valid reasons, but much more often as a, a pretext for creating these laws. Um, uh, Richie or, or Tristia, do you want to? Yeah, take Eric, it? I, I. I, I think this is an example of how important it becomes to, to be able to gather information. The, the cities uh, will make a number of claims um, to justify some of these ordinances. It was done in the panhandling case that I was talking about earlier. It's been done in the camping case that's going on in Boise, and, and I've seen it in other cases around the country. And um, what's fortunate is that the courts in these cases, at least the decisions that I read, is that the courts really are willing, if you bring the evidence to them, um, to uh, as well as the public itself, it seems like, and through the press, is willing to see through these pretexts if you can um, um, get past the prejudices that a lot of people have in their mind. And the way you get past those prejudices, or at least one way to get past those prejudices, is having really good data that's been collected about the actual problem, and that's that's irrefutable data. The cities don't generally um, um, do these kind of studies. They're just operating based on their prejudices, what they think is is happening. And so, when you're able to do it, you can often show that um, uh, these are just prejudices. These aren't based in reality, and show that to the public and show that to the courts. Just do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I would, um, I would echo that. Um, and in addition to making sure that you have good data, um, one of the things that we describe in the advocacy manual is um, holding the city to the burden of, of showing to the court that, in fact, those uh, claimed concerns are real and justified um, by data that the city itself has. Oftentimes, as Richie mentioned, these concerns are floated out but really are just pretext for removing homeless people from a particular area of the city or perhaps um, a pretext for removing homeless people from the city um, in its entirety. Um, so making sure that cities are challenged on their assertions is another really uh, important piece uh, along with having your own data to refute some of the city's claims. Uh, I know that in, um, in a different context, but in the food sharing context in the uh, city of Dallas case, there were some claims about uh, a city's interest in making sure that homeless people don't get unsafe or spoiled food. And while that was an interest that um, in a removed um, theoretical sense could be deemed an important or perhaps even compelling governmental interest, the city of Dallas had no data whatsoever that any homeless person who received food from the religious groups sharing food with them had ever actually become sick. Uh, so it wasn't a concern or a governmental interest that was rooted in reality. Uh, so it's important to hold the government accountable and also to have your own data to refute any of their claims. Thanks. Um, and kind of uh, on a uh, similar uh, front, there's a question about um, denial of, uh, of access to sanitary facilities, to bathrooms, um, uh, uh, or, um, or showers as a, a violation of human rights or as uh, a pretext to, to criminalization. Um, we, we saw an example actually earlier this year of the town of Burien, Connecticut, which both forbade bathing, or uh, Burien, uh, Washington, sorry, um, just south of Seattle, where uh, the city both forbade uh, homeless people from bathing in public restrooms and forbade them from, uh, from being in certain places if they had uh, what was, they deemed as uh, you know, disturbing body odor. So you know, as a catch twenty two, you can't. You could be arrested for bathing in public 
uh, facilities, and, but you could also be arrested if you smelled bad. So um, this is just uh, you know part of the the absurd nature of some of these uh, uh, laws. And uh, we actually did work specifically with the UN Special Rapporteur on the rights to water and sanitation when she came to visit this country in 2011. Um, as uh, an opportunity to raise just exactly these concerns that um, criminalizing people for their odor or for um, needing to take care of sanitary needs outdoors when the city is not providing adequate alternatives um, is a violation of human rights that is criminalization just the same as um, criminalizing sleeping or other, uh, other basic behaviors would be. Um, so that's, uh, th that's definitely right on point. And um, if uh, the, the folks who are asking those questions want to be in touch, I can certainly talk more about that offline. Um, one question that uh, might be uh, applicable uh, for Tenjiwe, if, if she's still here, um, is who, how is the work being done to connect the criminalization of homelessness to the emerging movement about racial profiling and police brutality from a human rights framework, seeing as there is a big overlap. And I think um, that's absolutely correct. Our um, report to the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination uh, did make the point that because communities of color are uh, disproportionately affected by homelessness um, and homeless people are disparately out on the streets and vulnerable to, uh, to uh, abuse by uh, police in that context, um, these uh, Conditions often, you know, intersect and have a, a building effect um, on each other. I do know that the um, groups in New York City, uh, the uh, group called Picture the Homeless, uh, was successful in a campaign um, in uh, that many people may have heard of in uh, taking down the city's um, racial profiling laws, and they got, um, in addition to racial profiling, they got profiling against homeless persons specifically uh, included as part of that legislation and they were able to work very closely as part of a broader coalition on that and make those connections. Um, but Tenjiwe, I don't know if you want to say anything more about the work um, that the network is doing, uh, working to um, bridge people uh, on the issues of police brutality and racial profiling, um, you know, particularly following uh, the events of this, this past summer and, and into the fall. Sure. Um, and I'll, I'll be brief. I think um, a way in which we're trying to make that connection is the issue of criminalization. Um, and so the criminalization of people based on um, race, ethnicity, but also based on um, identity uh, status and how, the, how criminalization connected with um, high rates of incarceration of particular vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable groups um, has a direct link to police violence in the in the United States, um, whether it's it's black people um, that are being targeted or it's um, um, uh, other individuals from different communities being targeted, specifically um, people that do not have access to adequate housing. And so, what we've been trying to do is connect that, and as well as to just expand sort of also the different vulnerable groups um, that are targeted. Um, and discriminated against and often and criminalized and their behavior and activities are criminalized um, and which makes them vulnerable um, to um, to vulnerable but also uh, um, has uh, has led to high rates of police violence um, with amongst those particular groups and so it's really just connecting it um, as well as again linking it back to a human rights frame um, um, and then also lifting up uh, the more powerful the movement becomes um, once uh, other groups who are also targeted, um, particularly those uh, without access to housing, um, are also you know who are also understanding how um, the criminalization of, of people um, um, has a direct connection to police violence. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, for staying with us uh, over time. And um, as I said, we've got our contact information here. Um, many more reports are available on all of our websites um, uh, with more information. But do please feel free to be in touch with us individually. Um, and 
the Law Center is a, uh, a organization that works uh, by donations. Um, and so if uh, you've enjoyed what you've seen here today, please do feel free to uh, make a donation on our website as well. Um, as I said before, the slides and um, reports are all available on our website or will be shortly. And uh, we should hopefully have the uh, entire broadcast uh, posted to our YouTube site uh, by later this week. Um, and uh, we will be following up with links to all of those for everyone. So thank you again, and um, good luck uh, moving human rights into human reality. Thanks.